Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, good evening and welcome. Uh, my name is Glenn Moot. I'm a professor here on our Midland campus and uh, also your moderator for tonight's event. And I'd like to welcome you to the Forum for Citizenship and Enterprises last event for the semester. Before we go any farther, let me remind you please to silence your uh, cell phones or other devices so those are not a distraction to you or others. Uh, we're pleased that you've joined us and we hope that you'll join us next semester. If you'd like to be made aware of our uh, future events, there's a sign-up sheet on the other side of the media booth on a glass table. Uh, just go ahead and put your name and email on there and, and we'll contact you and let you know about future events. Uh, on your way, students, on your way in, you were handed a survey. Those surveys are provided by the Institute for Humane Studies. They are our co-sponsor. Uh, they not only give you an opportunity to learn about their programs, but also to tell us who won the debate. And I'm sure these guys will be looking forward to the results uh, from that. So please don't hesitate to turn those in. There's a box, again, back on that glass table. There are also some baskets that you can use to submit those. And again, we turn those in. Those are a good indication not only of our attendance, but also your interest and also the success of the program. So please, please turn those in. One of you will, uh, uh, your name will be drawn for a $25 Amazon gift card. So hopefully uh, free stuff is an additional enticement. Um, no such thing as a free lunch, but maybe there's a free Amazon gift card. Um, the Institute for Humane Studies is located in Washington, D.C. They are a, um, an organization that advances a free society by enabling, enabling scholarship promoting the principles and practice of liberty. And if you'd like to know more about those programs, again, you can put your name essentially on their mailing list or contact me and I'd be happy to share uh, opportunities available through IHS. Also, our event could not be possible without the generous support of the John Templeton Foundation. The John Templeton Foundation serves as a philanthropic catalyst for discoveries relating to the big questions of human purpose and ultimate reality. With that, I will introduce our format for tonight. We will begin with 15-minute opening statements. Professor Kaplan will begin. Professor Jones will follow. Professor Kaplan will have the opportunity to ask Professor Jones questions and vice versa for five minutes. And then I have moderator's prerogative to ask questions as well. That will take us about 45 minutes. We'll then have a five-minute break. During that five-minute break, you're welcome to stretch your legs. Our presenters have an opportunity to finalize their closing statements. Also, there are some students who will have cards. If you have questions for our participants, and I hope that you will, uh, I suspect you'll have a lot you'll want to pursue, just write your question on those cards, and then uh, I'll get those cards. You can give those to me or to one of the students, and then I'll uh, ask those questions from the podium after our break. That'll take about 15 minutes and then our participants will have seven minutes each for closing statements. Before I begin, let me introduce our debaters to you. Professor Garrett Jones, on my left, will argue against open borders. He's Associate Professor of Economics at George Mason University. His research interests include monetary economics, corporate finance, and the economics of human intelligence. His first book, published by Stanford University Press, is entitled Hive Mind. I'm going to hold it up. These are on sale at a bargain price tonight. Don't go to Amazon. They're not going to beat this price. Uh, Professor Jones has them available. He's happy to sign them, to visit with you, talk to you about the book. And um, he probably doesn't want to take them home either. I don't want to carry them on the plane. No, no. So you must buy them. It is your responsibility under hospitality to buy all these books and make sure he does not go home with any books. Um, the book is titled Hive Mind, How Your Nation's IQ Matters So Much More Than Your Own. In addition to his academic work, he served as an economic policy advisor to Senator Orrin Hatch and as a staff economist to the Joint Economic Committee of the U.S. Congress. Prior to earning his Ph.D. in economics from the University of California, San Diego, he earned a bachelor's degree from Brigham Young University, a master's in public administration from Cornell, and a master's in political science from UC Berkeley. Professor Kaplan, on my right, argues for open borders. Professor Kaplan is professor of economics at George Mason University and a senior scholar at the Mercatus Center. He is author of The Myth of the Rational Voter, Why Democracies Choose Bad Policies, named the best political book of the year by the New York Times, and also author of Selfish Reasons to Have More Kids, Why Being a Great Parent is Less Work and More Fun Than You Think. Did you bring books? You'll have to go on Amazon for those. But. 
If you'd like to visit him in the D.C. area, he'll be happy to sign those as well. Um, he's published in the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, American Economic Review, the Economic Journal, and Journal of Law and Economics. Uh, and intelligence, and he has appeared on 2020 Fox News and C-SPAN and working on a new book, which should be out... 2017. Okay. After T titled, and uh, it's too late, because you'll all probably have graduated by then, but it's called The Case Against Education. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to it. So, uh, with that, I will uh, uh, leave it to our speakers to begin with their opening statements. Thank you very much, Glenn. And also, I do urge you to buy Garrett's book. It is a great book, so there's no debate about that. All right, now, just to begin with, how many of you guys have ever heard of apartheid? All right, most of you have, yes. So, and apartheid in South Africa was not just a system where the government didn't do a lot to help blacks. It was a system where, and it was not a system where discrimination was merely legal. It was a system where discrimination against blacks was mandatory. So it's the reverse of what we have here where discrimination is illegal, a system where not discriminating is illegal. All right, so all modern governments strictly regulate migration, especially for work. So actually there is something very similar to uh, South African apartheid right here, namely that there are a great many people on earth who cannot legally work here if an American employer wants to hire them, says I want to treat everyone, no matter what country they are from, equally, it is illegal for them to do so. Now, of course, almost everyone supports these regulations, and this includes self-styled advocates of free markets and free trade. Uh, the uh, exception made for labor is very standard, actually, and Garrett does illustrate this. Now, it's important to understand that immigration laws don't just deny charity. Serious immigration laws don't simply say that America is not going to help strangers or not going to help foreigners. It says that it is illegal for an American to hire a foreigner unless the U.S. government approves illegal for a U.S. landlord to rent to a foreigner unless the U.S. government approves, and so on. So in particular, they forbid workers from selling their labor to willing employers. Now, morally, it seems very hard to defend these regulations. So what would we think if there were laws that legally prevented women from working? Or if there were laws that legally prevented blacks from working? Or laws that legally prevented Jews from working? Or laws that legally prevented gays from working? And again, if you say, what is it that seems so wrong about immigration laws? Same thing that seems wrong about all these other laws, they proverbially punish people for choosing the wrong parents. Something that happened before you were born. You are going to be treated differently because of something over which you had no control for being born on the wrong side of a line on a map. Uh, so, now what is my alternative? So my alternative is open borders. Uh, what does this mean? Well, simple version, so non-criminals should be free to rent from willing landlords and work for willing employers anywhere on earth. Uh, now at minimum, Open borders sounds like a noble ideal, but unfortunately, as Garrett is going to tell you, living up to moral ideals can be very expensive. So you sell all that you have, give it to the poor. Very expensive moral ideal, although it does sound good, doesn't it? I'll sell. Then the question is, how expensive would it actually be to live up to this moral ideal? How much would treating foreigners like any other human being actually cost? You know, cost economically and cost otherwise. Uh, and here's my story. The best answer is that the net cost is actually much less than zero. In other words, justice is profitable. Justice pays big time. And again, just to get a foreshadow of what I'm talking about, so think about how much poorer we, we would be today not, uh, if, uh, if we had legally excluded blacks and women from working. So and not just, of course, how much poorer would blacks and women be, but how much poorer would whites and men be if black and female talent were locked up outside of the labor market indefinitely. All right, uh, so this is a title from, or you know, title stolen from a, a famous article by Michael Clemens, Trillion Dollar Bills on the Sidewalk. Uh, economists are often, uh, are often teased as people see a $20 bill on the sidewalk and say it can't really be there. If it were there, someone would have picked it up already. Uh, this is a story about there are trillion dollar bills on the sidewalk, enormous gains which could be picked up if only we would come to our collective senses. All right, so what is the main effect of open borders? Well, uh, the, most, the biggest effect is on global production, where it seems like there would be a massive increase. When economists just take standard models and crunch them and try to figure out how much richer would the world be if anyone on Earth could work anywhere they wanted, a long run estimate is that the output of the world would double. So it's not just saying that the output of the receiving countries would double. That by itself isn't very interesting, because of course when you get more people, there'll be more stuff made. The point is that the output of the globe doubles as a result. Now why would that be? Well, the answer is that some places on Earth are much more productive than other places. 
So if you imagine a case where you had a million people farming in Antarctica, right, so their productivity would be very low because they are farming under extremely inauspicious conditions. Imagine they were allowed to leave and go to someplace else where their labor were more productive. Obviously, they would be better off, but they are not the only ones. Everyone on Earth who buys food would be better off because when you move the Antarcticans to a more productive location, their productivity rises. What do they do with the extra food? They sell it on the world market, and then it comes into our hands. A uh, simple slogan version of this is a mind is a terrible thing to waste, and this applies to anyone on Earth, not just people that are born inside of the United States. So what would it actually look like to have open borders? Well, the best picture is it would look like an upscale version of the growth that China and India have enjoyed over the last few decades. So you'll see what actually happened in China and India. So there was deregulation, but also but a big part of the reason why the deregulation accomplished the miracles that it did is there's a lot of low productivity labor stuck out in the countryside, new industry springs in the cities, and workers migrate from the low productivity areas into the high productivity areas, increasing the total production of the countries, leading to the fantastic rise in wealth that we now see. So what this means is that rich areas would swell the population, and yes, you are in a rich area. Like Michigan's a rich area by world standards. Detroit is a rich area of the world by world standards, actually. So rich areas would swell the population in the same way that in China and India. The rich parts of those countries have swelled with population. Right? And on the other hand, poor, area, poor areas would depopulate in the same way that they have in other countries that have, that have developed. Now, simple models say that the main result of this would be that first world capital and third world labor would profit, and third world capital and first world labor would suffer. Right, so that is what simple models say. So this is where the idea of immigration hurting American workers comes from. However, uh, better models recognize there's actually an important qualification with here, here qualification, namely that there are many different kinds of labor. So even when you're thinking about high school dropouts, a high school dropout from the United States is very different from high school dropout in Bangladesh. The skills that American high school dropout has are very different. Most ways they are, they are more highly skilled which means that a big result, or the likely result of immigration would be that high school dropouts from the US would be supervising high school dropouts from Bangladesh. Uh, you can think about uh, you know, what goes on in a typical American restaurant. You may have workers in the restaurant, none of whom are considered very highly skilled, but nevertheless, there are those that are fluent in English who are using wait, usually waiting tables, and there are those who are not so fluent in English who are working in the kitchen or doing dishes. Right? So in this way, they specialize and are not competitors with each other in the same way that we might naively think. Uh, now, when researchers go and try to factor these differences in, they find that even low-skilled native workers rise as a result of immigration. In fact, the only losers from immigration seem to be previous waves of immigrants. The people who actually suffer are earlier generations of immigrants or earlier groups of immigrants who are directly competing with new arrivals. Although, interestingly, uh, the previous immigrants are also the ones who are most favorable to immigration because they are actually the family members, often, of the new people arriving. Uh, also worth pointing out that labor is, of course, not labor's only asset. So home-owning workers also get a huge windfall. There's been quite a bit of research on what are the effects of immigration on housing prices. And as you might guess, the effect is generally to increase housing prices by raising population. Uh, so the slogan I like is, this is not trickle-down economics, it's Niagara Falls economics. If you were to unleash all the productivity of the world, allow anyone to take their skills and use them wherever on earth they are most productive, total production of the world would dramatically increase leading to a massive rise in the productivity of mankind. Now, anytime you think about the effect of one innovation on one small group, there is easy to see that one small group will lose. So uh, Uber is now hurting taxi drivers. And when driverless cars come along, Uber drivers are going to suffer. However, what is the effect of Uber on the welfare of, of mankind? There, there is no doubt. There is a large increase in production. And when there's a large incre increase in production, average welfare is going to go up. Similarly, the driverless cars. Similarly, with allowing people to take a job and work anywhere. There is so much talent that is currently being wasted in places where it is not being put to good use. And if people could move, they would move to places where their talents were more greatly used. All right, uh, furthermore, so another lesson from migration fuel growth in China and India. So massive increase in production is pro-poor. The people who have gained the most from the rise in productivity in India and China have been desperately poor people who previously may have been working for a dollar a day and now may be enjoying earnings of $5 a day or $10 a day, which may not seem like very much to us, but is a world of difference for them. So under open borders, absolutely poor foreigners will move to opportunity, uh, drastically reducing absolute poverty is one of the main effects. 
Uh, migration also will drastically reduce global inequality, two-thirds of which is actually now between nations. There's a lot of talk about the inequality that we have within the United States. By world standards, this is really no big deal. The actual inequality that's worth worrying about is the inequality between countries. Right? And if you were to go and tell your sad stories about inequality in the U.S. to someone in Haiti and see how much they sympathize, you'll get a perspective. Uh, but, and I don't want to sugarcoat anything about open borders, under open borders, the remaining poverty and inequality will be much more visible. So you will have to look at it. You will actually have to see more people who are absolutely poor. They will be much better off than they were back in their home country, but back in their home country, you don't have to see them, and here you do. Uh, so, a uh, key point, if my story is entirely right, natives are still going to complain a lot. Everything that I say could come to pass, and people will still say that events proved me wrong because they will see some poverty with their own eyes and say, this shows this was all terrible, this wasn't what we were promised. I'm actually telling you, that's what you should expect. Instead of looking at the poverty that is now visible, you should look at what is happening to overall well-being of the world, of course, as well as the actual living standards of the people who are still here. Uh, so Garrett and me. So Garrett and I have a long history. I've known Garrett for almost 10 years now. We've had a lot of great discussions. Uh, talking, with Garrett, talking about immigration with Garrett is very different about talking about immigration with almost anyone else that I've ever known. So while we do disagree, we disagree in a way that is quite different from you know, almost any other two people that you're likely to hear on this topic. So most of my immigration debates bog down in a long list of complaints that I will just say are enumerate complaints. Complaints by people who do not look at empirical research, who don't look at the size of different effects. Uh, they're oblivious to what Garrett Jones has amusingly called vast empirical literatures. So on Twitter, Garrett Jones will often do a tweet saying, if only there were vast empirical literature on X. And of course, this is sarcastic because Garrett is pointing out there is a vast empirical literature on X. So most people complain about immigration, talk about the effect on wages without paying any attention to all the research that has been done, finding very small effects. They pay a lot of attention to the effects of immigration on budget without looking at estimates of the net effects there, which are generally in the ballpark of zero. There's a lot of talk about the effect of immigration on crime. People who have neutrally looked at the data will tell you that immigrants actually have a lower crime rate than natives. So these are frustrating complaints, especially when someone makes a whole lot of enumerate complaints one after another, because even given the time to respond, there isn't enough time to actually respond to each of them. Uh, my general answer to all of these is almost everything is small compared to, glo to doubling global GDP. You could list 100 complaints. Once you put price tags on them, you'll realize, while compared to increasing the wealth of the world by many trillions of dollars every single year, these complaints are really just not worth worrying about. Uh, now, Garrett, unlike most of the people that I argue with, understands my argument quite well. Uh, instead, he focuses on one big objection with interesting empirical evidence on its side, right, uh, which uh, I call, and I think Garrett probably calls, the institutional critique. Right, so as far as I can tell, and I'll leave it to Garrett to give his own, to speak for himself, but as far as I can tell, Garrett does favor open borders for a subset of humanity, so as long as immigrants are two things, high-skilled and westernized. Right, uh, now, of course, it's worth pointing out that still hundreds of millions of people, so by normal standards, Garrett is actually very pro-immigration, although maybe he will correct me afterwards. Uh, now, Garrett's fear, as I understand it, is that low-skilled and or un-Western immigrants will proverbially kill the goose that lays the golden eggs. Uh, what are they going to do? Well, they're going to show up here. They're going to use their skills to be more productive than they could be in their home country. However, they are also going to make our country less productive than it was before. Why? They're going to bring their economic illiteracy with them. They're going to bring their authoritarianism, authoritarianism with them. And ultimately, they're going to turn the United States and other first world countries into what Ant Coulter calls third world hell holes. So they will bring all their problems with them. Individually, the problems are invisible. One person coming from Mexico to work as a janitor does not turn the country into a hellhole. Two don't. Three don't. But let in 50 million, and that's going to actually make the harm visible for all to see. Uh, now, this is not a crazy fear. Right? However, I still see very little sign that it is a serious problem, much less serious enough to outweigh the massive benefits of immigration or the grave injustice of the status quo. Right? Now, just looking at some basic evidence, uh, it is true that immigrants are much more democratic than natives, and this has become increasingly true over time. Uh, so if you think that Democrats are vastly worse than Republicans, then this is a problem. I don't think that they're vastly worse than Republicans. I think that they are both terrible. So, <laughs> uh, But uh, either way, I will point out a saving grace, which is that immigrants have very low turnout. 
So even if they would vote terribly, if they did vote, they don't actually vote very much. So in fact, the problem is much smaller than it would seem. Uh, now, deeper evidence. Uh, there's been a, quite a bit of complaint, uh, complaining about the political views of immigrants, but actually there's been very little empirical work on this. So this is the frustrating situation where you feel like first you have to figure out what your opponent's case would be and then do the work for them and then announce the results. Uh, so anyway, this is something that I have done myself. So I have found that immigrants are a little bit more socially conservative. So uh, by the measures that I use, this is from the general social survey, they are plus 0.19 standard deviations more socially conservative. And they're also a bit more economically liberal. So 0.35 standard deviations more economically liberal than, liberal than natives. So not nothing. And both in directions that I consider uncongenial. But nevertheless, in the, in the broad scheme of things, not that big of a deal. All right. Uh, so now, let's continue with the institutional critique. Now, while Garrett does worry about immigrants' actual personal politics, uh, what I've been learning lately is that he's much more focused on what is, what is called their deep history. Uh, so here's research, and I've actually been reading quite a, bit, quite a bit about this in recent weeks. I'm going to be blogging it later on. I've learned a lot. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of research saying that migration-adjusted history matters. What does this mean? Well, simple version. Successful countries are usually inhabited by descendants of socially and technologically advanced societies. You see a country that seems to be a much richer place than it used to be. This is usually because the inhabitants are totally different people than they used to be. They are not descended from the previous inhabitants. So for example, the United States is extremely rich. When the Indians were here, it was, by global standards, extremely poor. What happened to change the results? Seems like the main result is that now there are hardly any descendants of Indians left. Right? And instead, they've been replaced by the descendants of much, of much more economically successful civilizations, which is why we see what we see around us right now. All right, now Garrett's fear is that lowest skilled immigration may seem great in the short run. Right, so you hire a nanny, seems like this allows an American mom to go and work as a computer programmer, wealth the world's much greater. But the concern is that in the long run, countries that admit descendants of backward societies will likely fall behind. Uh, here are my two responses. First of all, I'd say Garrett is being paranoid. Uh, exactly which earlier waves of immigration to the US undermined us so far? Uh, now, there is an idea in this research that previous groups that seem backwards, such as Russians or Irish, aren't really backwards because they come from societies that were advanced. Although the way that they usually measure the advancement comes from, well, were people in your general country advanced? So for example, if you've got Irish immigrants, then since they were part of the British Empire, they count as being advanced because the most advanced culture in that area was advanced. The Irish themselves seem to, be, seem to have been quite backward. So there's something funny about the way that the actual, uh, the, advantage of the state of development of societies is, act, is actually measured in this research. So it does seem that in fact the United States has let in enormous numbers of unskilled, unwesternized immigrants in the past, including people from the most authoritarian countries in the developed world at the time. So enormous numbers of immigrants let in from Tsarist Russia, enormous numbers of immigrants let in from the Kaiser's Germany. And what harm have they done so far? What have they ever done? Can you look around and see the damage? I just don't see the damage. It seems to me that Garrett is so convinced that they have to do a lot of damage that he hasn't really paid a lot of attention to what happened in the past. Or he's very eager to say that, no, that prior experience doesn't really prove anything because they don't count as really being undeveloped. And I say, really, they should count as undeveloped. Uh, rather, what happened is undeveloped people came to the United States, and they became developed. Usually, of course, not the very first generation, which is just desperately trying to figure out a way to make a living in a strange society. But parents come, they do the best they can, and then their kids grow up knowing nothing else, and they couldn't care less about the Tsar or the Kaiser or anything else. Uh, now, my second response is that Garrett is actually selectively reading the research that he relies upon. So if you, take, if you actually go and read the original papers, what you'll find is that the very same researchers that Garrett uses to back up his position also find huge long-run effects of geography. They find huge effects of geographic latitude, huge effects of being landlocked, huge effects of islands on the modern state of countries. It says that if you take a look at the population, popula your migration adjusted population, but you also take a look at these other factors, you see that a lot, though not all, of the reason why richer countries are prosperous is actually due to these geographic factors. Uh, and actually, if there's any way that you can overcome problems like, li like latitude, being landlocked islands, it is precisely migration. So even if you take the research that Garrett is relying upon very seriously indeed, it doesn't actually, in the net, on net, say what he thinks that it says. Thank you.
Well, I'd like to start off by making one slight correction of my colleague's uh, very useful summary of my views, which is that I am a huge fan of Singapore, and Singapore is most emphatically not a Western nation. It's a gloriously diverse nation with a mixture of people from China and India and many other countries around the world who've come together to create a high productivity, diverse nation. So I don't hold any particular brief for westernized countries. I just wanted to make that clear before I began. Singapore, one of my favorite countries in the world. All right. So, is that working? I'll stand here then. Oh, so if we're thinking about the short run, about 20 years or so, I basically agree with Brian's view. The short run effect of large numbers of workers coming to the rich countries, pretty small on the lifestyles of most of us here. So, but as we learn in economics, ooh, as we learn in economics, good economics looks at the long run. And I particularly want you to think about the 100 plus year long run, the world that your children and grandchildren will inhabit. I particularly don't care that much about the very long run. I'm a bachelor, I have no children. I don't particularly care about the long run future. The glories of open borders will be fantastic for me. I'll get the glories of diversity, I'll get a lot of great ethnic food, I'll get a lot of interesting cultures that be, I'll be exposed to. It'll be fascinating to meet people from different societies. This would be great for me. But I want you to think about you and your children and your grandchildren. So, would open borders wound the golden goose? Rich countries are incredibly rare treasures. You should wonder where these rare treasures come from. Open borders advocates don't like to think very often, or at least very openly, about where these rare treasures, these rich countries, these fantastic free market oriented institutions come from. They're rare treasures, and one should take care of them to be concerned about whether they could be destroyed or even weakened. So, uh, my fellow economists have been so interested in the question of why some countries are richer than others that they've started asking questions that you're not really supposed to ask. The question of why some countries are rich and others are poor are so is such an important question, we should be willing to go everywhere to find the truth. So economists, a lot, like a lot of folks, have looked at a map of the world, one kind of like this one, and they've noticed that a lot of the, the rich countries in the world, as, leaving aside some natural resource rich countries, the rich countries in the world tend more than average to be either in that part of Europe, in this part of East Asia, or they are inhabited by descendants of those countries. So in East Asia, a lot of folks have moved from China to Hong Kong, down here to Singapore, to some countries in Southeast Asia. People from Europe have moved to Australia, New Zealand, um, in, the in North America. In the academic literature, these areas are often called Neo-Europes. North America, New Zealand, Canada, Australia. So, um, but economists have actually gone beyond that, saying like, okay, we've noticed this pattern. What does it mean? What should we really look for behind it? So this literature I refer to as the deep history theory of economic development. It's uh, widely publicized. It's become uh, sort of a uh, bigger literature in the years since the open borders movement has gotten going. And um, here's one article in a top journal in economics by um, two, two top professors. And you can see here, they've been noticing that Historical factors, deep historical factors, seem to affect outcomes today. And in particular, some of those historical factors include the ancestral composition of current populations. So a lot of my fellow academics have wondered, what is it about these ancestral composition of current populations that matters? Is it genes? Is it culture? Is it some complicated combination? What is it? People have thrown out a lot of words. And the academics in the field say, we don't really have great tests to sort this out. So we don't exactly know why this is true, but we know that it is true. And what's true? It's that outcomes are persistent. So I want you to ask yourself, what's your nation's SAT score? And here I don't mean the, the SAT you take to get into college. Here I mean a measure that uh, people in this field have worked with to a great degree. Um, three different measures. States. How long have, your an have the ancestors of the people living in your country lived under non-tribal government? A. Agriculture. How, for how many thousands of years have the ancestors of the people in your country been farmers? T, technology. What is um, 
what is the measure of what, how much of the world's past technological progress did people in your country use in 1500 AD, 0 AD, 1000 BC? So academics have created measures of these, and they've created what I call your nation's SAT score. And as you would imagine, just like in your lives, a high SAT score seems to predict greater success. Not perfectly, of course, true on average, many exceptions, interesting exceptions, but we don't build our life around the exceptions. We build our life around the rules. Plenty of people die every day, even though they wore their seatbelt like they were supposed to. So the thing I want you to notice is that migration changes your nation's SAT score. You might tell an anecdote about a country. Let me pick a country called America. I don't care about an anecdote about one particular country. I care about what's true on average. I know a guy who smoked every day, never died of lung cancer. So the thing is, migration is an experiment that we've run in very brutal ways at times over the last 500 years. People have moved from one country to another, and we can see what happened to the economy in those countries. So here's a piece of data. Here's a big graph. You can pull this up on yourself. Um, it's easy to find on the web. It's a paper by Shonda Cook and Putterman. Um, I tweeted this out on Columbus Day. Um, and uh, the x-axis records, just look at the graph on the right, the one that says ancestry adjusted. The x-axis there is how many thousands of years, for how many thousands of years, the average person in that country, how long, how long their ancestors have been practicing farming. Um, you can see that Singapore, Hong Kong, let me label that there, Singapore, Hong Kong, India, Pakistan, these are nations where their ancestors have been farming for 9,000 plus years. Whereas countries over here, Botswana, Namibia, Ethiopia, their ancestors have been practicing agriculture for about 4,000 years. And it turns out that knowing how long your ancestors have practiced agriculture is a moderately good predictor of how rich your nation is today. This is just walking through the A in the SAT, but I could do the same for the rest. So it turns out, you, if you want to get a good guess of how rich a country is, you don't look at what that country's SAT score was in 1500, because a lot of people have moved around since 1500. You want, if you want to know how rich a country is going to be, you look at what their um, SAT score is today. In 1500, the USA, Singapore, and Hong Kong had fairly modest um, experience with agriculture. Native Americans in particular, um, First Nations folks in First Nations peoples in Canada, um, modest experience with agriculture. But since then, a lot of people, in quite brutal ways often, moved in and seemed to bring some trait with them that helped to make them productive. Here's the same graph um, for technology. This one uh, I'm pulling out of a New York Times column, in case you think that I'm quoting some obscure data that no one in the real world knows about. This showed up in a fantastic New York Times column some time ago, the great Catherine Rampell, who's a very good reporter. She, was, she had the nerve, she had the bravery to, uh, to, to write about this in the Times, and I tweeted about it. Um, so this x-axis this x measure measures how much uh, experience your ancestors have with using the best technologies that existed in their day. It's usually some mixture of writing, vehicles, and metals. So it turns out that you can see the title of this paper. I mean, Komen Easterly and Gong, Bill Easterly, a moderately famous economist, really great economist, um, co-authored this very brave paper. The title of it says it all. Was today's poverty determined in 1000 BC? Actually, their answer is, no, it wasn't. Today's poverty was determined in 1000 BC only if you pay attention to the migration-adjusted technology level. When they report their statistical results without controlling for the fact that a lot of people have moved in the last 500 years, often brutally, often in chains, um, they didn't get very good results. Once they accounted for migration, once they noticed that the SAT score of your ancestors mattered more than the SAT score of your location, then they got good results. So here you can see there are some interesting exceptions. I like to talk about exceptions. If I had more than 15 minutes, I'd talk about them. I mentioned Botswana, fantastic. You know, it's the great African miracle economy. It has uh, lower levels of corruption than uh, many countries in southern Europe. It deserves more attention on the global scene. My fellow economists have done a pretty good job noticing the importance of that miracle. But the rule is where we should place our bets about the future. And the rule is, on average, higher levels of ancestral experience with technology predicts greater productivity today. 
So uh, I just want to do a quick run. I did a quick run through um, to try to inspect the goose here, just looking at the agricultural channel. And I'm, all I'm doing here is pulling off numbers from, um, from the uh, earlier paper that I cited, the Chanda Putterman paper. And so I said, uh, let's consider a pure hypothetical. Let's, cons let's just take it for granted that open borders um, leads to an average ancestry adjusted agricultural history. So you become kind of like the average country in the world. A lot of people come from a lot of places. I'm sure they're very nice people. And uh, once they get here, they, um, they change the nation's average SAT score to about the average amount for the planet as a whole. And it turns out that actually, I'd say for North America, North America has had a lucky enough economic history that open borders actually look somewhat doable. According to just this simple estimate, it's not the only estimate you could create, the U.S. would be about 30% poorer than otherwise. The average person in the U.S. would be about 30% poorer than otherwise. And your kids might, your children and grandchildren might wind up at the top of that heap. It's not crazy to imagine that your children and grandchildren would do 30% better than average in, this, in, an open, in such an open borders world. That might work out okay. But instead, look at Hong Kong. I mentioned before that Hong Kong was a uh, country that had a vast historical experience with agriculture, about 9,000 plus years, ancestry adjusted. And um, there, what they would be facing is a 70% decline in expected productivity in the very long. Again, a crude estimate. So for, for them, so for your children and grandchildren, if you were living in Hong Kong and you were saying, should Hong Kong embrace open borders? Well, in the very long run, I don't know if that's 100 years, 120 years, I don't know how long, some very long run. Your children, if you think about that, would actually have to be, earn about three times the national average in order to not be hurt by open borders economically. So if your, nation, if your wage is getting cut down by two thirds, then you have to triple it to get back up to where you were. So, nation, so for open borders for Hong Kong, cutting their average SAT score that much would be, in the very long run, predict a lot of economic weakness. Again, just an estimate. And as they say on the web, your mileage may vary. So here's one way migration might matter. I've only got a few minutes. I can't go through all of the stories, some of which are well documented by academics. Uh, I think the cultural channels are quite interesting, um, but it would take longer to discuss. I just wrote a book on IQ. You can see copies of it here. IQ is often considered a controversial subject. Some days, depending on my mood, I think this is the most controversial sentence in my book. Governments are made by people, after all. When new people come to your country, they will shape your government. I would like to bring in people to my country who will dramatically improve my government. That would be awesome. If I could get the world's inventors, the world's great inventors from China and Singapore and Japan and India, the great scientists and engineers from these nations to come here and <laughs> vote. That would be awesome. Under open borders, I might get that, but m I might not. So here's Nathan Nunn of Harvard um, talking about the deep history of economic development, deep history theory. Um, and here he's tying it to the politics. He's partly summing up other people's views, so you'd have to read it in context and see if this is really him stating his own views. Uh, Nathan Nunn is considered a leading light of modern development economics, modern economic history. Fantastic guy. Um, so here's what he says. The primary thing that migrants brought with them is themselves. They brought their beliefs and values about freedom, liberty, equality, and the appropriate role of government. These were the crucial factors that determined the nature of the initial institutions that were established. So you might wonder, do people shape their institutions? Do institutions change over the long run? Here's one piece of evidence. Again, I'll probably get to talk about more of this evidence later, but uh, with just a minute left, I'll just sum it up with this slide. So um, here's a measure on the x-axis that really is basically the SAT score. It's that weighted with a few other things. Great paper by James Ang, um, who's at um, NTU in Singapore. And um, the x-axis here is basically a rough measure of the SAT score for a lot of countries. And the y-axis is the quality of institutions as measured by the World Bank. So countries with really good institutions, they tend to have, broadly speaking, markets. They tend to have low levels of corruption. They tend to have a bureaucracy that actually gets things done within a year or two. Rare things for humans, right? Most governments are pretty bad. Your government could get a lot worse. I know people love to bellyache and say, this administration is so much worse than that administration. 
whatever. Those changes are nothing compared to the changes that exist across countries. So um, the x-axis is basically your nation's SAT score. Your y-axis is the quality of institutions. And this is a measure. These are all deep historical measures. These are ancestry adjusted. I just cut this out of the paper. Ancestry adjusted pre-modern development. Nations that had more ancestry adjusted pre-modern development tend to have better institutions. Nations that have weaker um, pre-modern development tend to have poor institutions. There are some exceptions. But if your plan is, I'm going to use open borders, and I suspect that our SAT score will drop down around to here, and your hope is that institutions are going to stay really good, that's a big empty space. Hoping that you're going to land in that big empty space, you're totally welcome to take that bet. If your morality tells you open borders is the objectively right thing to do, I want you to do it. For the rest of us, we might have to think about the fact that your nation's SAT score appears to matter so much more than your own. All right, now we move to questions. Uh, each of our participants has the opportunity to ask the other questions. Uh, we're going to try to keep this to five minutes. We'll begin with Professor Kaplan, who will have questions for Professor Jones, we hope. Sure. Uh, we, do we ping pong, or what do we do? Uh, we'll give you five, and then we'll give. Five questions in a row? Five, five minutes. minutes. Five minutes. Oh. So I just talk for five minutes, and then no, he. I and ask then, him questions. Oh, I, oh we okay. answer for five minutes. Okay, you're, you're, on, you're, you're, on the, all right, you're on the hot seat. Yeah, I'm on the hot seat. The shorter he is, the more questions you can very ask. Good. And very good. Very good. All right, so this 30% fall in average uh, per capita income for the U.S. that you've computed, yeah. is this 30% fall for the current inhabitants or 30% fall for the, few, oh, like for, the new, newly, for the newly composed? I'm treating it as an other things equal. How would their world be compared to a, key, a, a future world where they kept their yes. score the same? Yes, so but basically, but, yeah, holding but in other words, the average, people, so the average person in the United States under open borders will have an income 30% less than what people today have. No, not, no, no, this isn't about today versus the future. This is other things equal. This is answering the question, imagine an America that did have open borders mm -hmm. versus an America that followed, say, Japan's policy of letting in very few immigrants. And imagine, compare those two 100 years from now. Japan policy versus open borders policy 100 years in the future. What are those futures like? Suppose I can go in a time machine where that's the only lever I press and I get to go on both time machine rides. How will those two worlds look different 100 plus years in the future? That's, just, that's an other things equal exercise. Economists are great at that. Yes, yes. So, but, but, but again, so, you know, in other words, so, so we, we go forward in the future and we look at the United States, so there'll be a ton of additional people there. Yes. And, the, and the, are you saying the per capita standard of living of the people in that country will be 30% less, less than it otherwise would have been? Yes, exactly. Okay. However, there are going to be very different people there. Yes. Yes. So in fact, uh, and, you, and uh, you would expect that the people with the higher SAT score from before, would, you know, the, the descendants of the current population, would in fact be well above average for those societies. Uh, not, but we already know, as you mm -hmm. pointed out yourself, yes. inequality within countries is much yes. smaller than inequality across countries. That's, only that's why I actually said, that's, excuse mm -hmm. me, that's why I actually mm -hmm. said that um, you have to ask yourself whether you think your descendants will wind up 30% higher than the average person in that country. Right. That's and not anything yes. we can work out in great mm -hmm. detail in the short time period. I mean, it's something that you would certainly expect, isn't it, Garrett? Thirty percent isn't that big. Yes. No, no, yeah, because yeah. actually, yeah. I mean, if you look, I mean, I studied um, mm -hmm. immigrant wages within the U.S. and I've mm -hmm. looked at um, ethnic wage gaps across countries, yeah. and 30, 40 percent is about um, that's on that's in the range of what one finds. That's why I said it might mm -hmm. be doable for the U.S. Mm -hmm. I so, specifically mm -hmm. said that. It's exactly. reasonable to think yeah. they might be thirty percent better off. By normal standards, that's a very pro open borders position, isn't it? I'm totally happy to note that in some okay. cases, I'm totally happy to be candid. All right. So, you know, bigger question. So, in your view, how many people who currently are not allowed in would actually, would, would actually be highly beneficial to let in? What, what do you mean? So, in other, in other words, you know, just based upon your graphs, it seems like the entire population of China is a very good candidate, entire population of India. There are billions of people who currently can't come, but by your own chart, it seems like they would be a benefit for us in the long run. Yeah. So totally. do you favor letting in unlimited immigration? It doesn't matter what I favor personally. I'm not, I really, really, I want people to think about the issues here rather than my personal morality. I, you know, my personal morality matters much less than the actual facts. But I'm happy mm -hmm. to say that if on yes. average mm -hmm. a nation chose a policy of letting in everyone mm -hmm. who lets in, who has higher than average, higher than U.S. average SAT scores, that nation will be richer in the long run. That's a, that's a reasonable bet. Not a guarantee, but a reasonable bet. So we, we so in, like, in all of your things on Twitter, I can't remember you ever saying, have ever, any tweets saying, wouldn't it be great if we were to go and let in anyone from China, anyone from India? 
Why is it you're so much so concerned with arguing with me against the vast majority of people who favor something that you think who oppose something you think would be good? Um, I'm really glad to talk about my personal opinions and like why I frame my public arguments the way I do. That's a totally cool thing to talk about. I, I'm basically trying to pick up the things that other people aren't talking about. It's the low-hanging fruit. How many people are talking about how it would be great to let in billions of people from India and China? Seems like that's really low-hanging fruit, and you don't talk about that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, my, my missionary angle is different from yours. I was a missionary many decades ago. I'm here for the science. And this, according to you, the science says it would be great to let in billions of immigrants from China and India. And actually, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm glad yes, to make yes. it on a, on a live stream feed that people around the world are watching right now. That's right. a great way to make it. Right, so by the way, when I was reading the papers, I noticed there's actually one group of people that come out um, with much higher scores than the Chinese or the Indians in terms of at least many measures of civilization, mm -hmm. people of the Middle East. Uh -huh. By many measures, they are the best people in the world. Uh, again, what, what are your views on letting in unlimited numbers of people from the Middle East? Yeah, I'm really not here to talk about my personal morality. That's totally great. We'll talk about that after the time. What Let's talk your, about the science during right, our brief right, What is your view about the, about the effect in 100 years of letting in unlimited people from the Middle East? People I'd have great. to look at the SAT scores. If their SAT yeah. scores above average, go for it. So that, the, that the, would the, probably the countries raise have great standards. SAT scores. Hey, pardon? Countries have great SAT scores yeah. by your measure. Yeah. So would you say they're, they're just weird outliers and we shouldn't let them, or, and it would have bad effects to let them in despite their high SAT scores? Or do you think, in fact, that um, popular views about Middle Eastern immigrants are bad or actually wrong? Yeah, I, I don't know. Partic I don't, I'm not an anthropological expert on that. Glad to talk about it. And, you know, I'm looking at what's true on average. You tell me what's true. I mean, I'll, I'm happy to look at the data set again and see what's exactly true. All right. All right. Um, so uh, you did use you your 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 discussion of Antarctica um, really did push that point that some places are more productive than mm -hmm. others. Um, to what extent do you think productivity? Why do you think some countries have better institutions than others? Yes. Yeah, so first, public opinion. Yes. Yeah. Second, second, second. But second of all, there's also a big element of status quo bias. And where does the yes. status quo come from? That's a great question. That I don't know. That's a great question. Yeah, I, you know, if you see countries I'd like to know that where that status quo you know, comes from. Say, if you see the countries that are working well right now, it is a fair bet they will continue working well in the future. Indeed. Even, uh, even, even if there are many other changes. Yeah. Um, so, and uh, one more question. Um, uh, uh, Oh, so um, how do you, what do you think it would take for, what are the kinds of things that would lead to the U.S. quality of institutions declining? Hmm. I mean, of course, just the continuation what? of what's going on right now will lead them to decline. They are, they are in mild decline. Mm -hmm. uh, so what would it take for... What would it take yeah. for the U.S.? What kinds of events yeah. could you imagine that would lead to, like, the U.S. or other rich countries winding mm -hmm. up with sort of the level of economic freedom of, like, countries in Central America, or the yeah. Middle East, or South Asia? Yeah, so if you were to instantly teleport the entire population of the world into the United States right now. Okay. Very different. Again, so a key, a, key, a key fact about the way that immigration works is that while people from, uh, while, while people from less developed countries often do have unfortunate views that would be bad if implemented, the first generation really has very little political power. They're focused on just taking care of their own lives. And the next generation largely grows, largely grows up being acculturated to the new society. This is how it's worked in the past, and I don't see why we wouldn't expect it to work that way again. So again, like if you were to have a change that is much more dramatic than one that you're likely to get, you know, so if you ask me, so what, you know, like what are the cases where open borders has worked most poorly, or where, where immigration has had the, had the, worst, the worst effects? Uh, my honest answer is Palestinian immigration into Jordan and Lebanon, where it really did seem like it was a large enough, a large enough group, we, uh, of a group that already had very strong internal cohesion that actually moved when the institutions intact to countries where they were able to change the political equilibrium. But again, that's very different from almost all other immigration in the world, precisely because most people don't move with their entire institutions intact, and so they move person at a time, going in and starting in at the bottom of the countries where they arrive, and in this way, they are acculturated to a much more functional system. A minute. So, um, so I, I want to push on this issue. It seems as though part of your model of institutions is that there's a ratchet effect, where institutions are much more likely to increase in quality based on good immigrants coming than a decline in quality from low SAT score immigrants coming. Hmm. Actually, I don't think so. I mean, so I also wouldn't be very optimistic about sending a bunch of people with your good SAT scores to a dysfunctional country and seeing things working out very well there. If you were to go and send the people in this room to Haiti, I don't think we would make much difference. I think that they are just locked in a really bad equilibrium. So uh, we would basically start in at the bottom rungs of Haitian society, and it's, you know, it's just messed up in 100 different ways. So if you uh, think yeah. if it was 20 or 30% yeah. of the population. Yeah. 20 or 30% yeah. of Americans moved to Haiti. 
And uh, if we looked 50 to 70 years later, we wouldn't see much change. That's your yeah, prediction. I think it would still be pretty messed up. That's right. So, you know, and you can actually see, you know, see there was about a 20 or 30 year period where Americans ran Haiti and they didn't seem to be able to fix it. Mm -hmm. So in, at least in terms of those political channels you're talking about. Yeah, we do know that colonies yeah. don't really, haven't yes. really changed things that much, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so we, we always got two minutes, so keep going. Um, well, um, so what do you think the, sh the um, short run effect would be? What's the, what's the worst case scenario on wages? Let's just, let's just push that. Right. I mean, there's this Borjas paper yeah, that yeah. came out recently. Yeah. I don't believe in it that much, but I think right. it's interesting enough to talk about. Yeah. So, you know, if only there were vast empirical literature on the effect of immigration on wages. So, usually, you know, so there's a lot of people work on this. Usually they're very boring people. Boring people who don't have any particular strong views about anything. They're just looking at a very narrow question. And the typical estimate is that if you were to go and incre uh, increase the population of a country by 10%, this will rate, reduce wages for natives by 1%. Uh, so, and you're, and you're asking, so like, what, what is a very yeah, the, high estimate of that? So, yeah, so the new Borjas yeah. paper found a much yeah. bigger effect from the right. uh, Mario boat lift. Yeah, so it's, you know, again, only, you know, only one paper out of many, so like, yeah. you know, I, I just wouldn't put them, I, I never put a lot of stock in the original paper. Uh -huh. So the, uh, there was a previous paper finding no effect, and that, I will admit, always seemed like it was just too, uh, like, zero, you know, zero seems too strong. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but again, but, but, but your question is, uh, you know, like, so how big, like, what sort of, what's, what is a high range of, of, of the effect? No, or, high, high, low, yeah. me, you know, whatever. Yeah. So you know, like it's it's believable. It's believable to me that the true effect is twice the consensus estimate of what yeah. it really is, which would still be yes. small, right? And you know, yeah. so by the way, we're, you know, every now and then people point out how it's very easy for privileged professors to talk about the wonders of open borders because we're shielded from competition. Garrett and I are actually in one of the very few labor markets in the country that has open borders already. Oh, totally. Yes, completely. because research, research economists are allowed to come in and work at well, virtually any university in the country. So yeah, it is quite well, quite plausible to me that our wages would be much higher if we would just kick out all the foreign professors. Yeah. But I wouldn't uh, want that. Yes, but I love them. I love them. They're Indeed. my friends. I don't want them. But in any case, if you're paying tuition, I don't think you want them kicked out because they are helping you guys. How can I break this up? We're going to run to uh, five, right to our five-minute break. So you're welcome to take a break. Our debaters will formulate their closing uh, statements. And uh, also, don't forget, uh, we'll have uh, students with cards to write your questions on. So we'll have time for audience questions uh, right after the break. So go ahead and uh, talk to this lady here. She'll give you some cards. You can write your question on there. Uh, get that card to me or to her, and uh, I will ask those questions after the break. Yes. By the way, I hit an emotional seesaw on your 1,000 BC. Okay, I've got some questions here for our participants. First question, what about national security? Hmm. <laughs> I'm happy to take on that yeah. one. I'm happy no, to take I'm, the Kaplanian yeah. position yeah. on this one. I'll do it, yeah. But. Um, so, so, in, so, um, yeah. Hmm. Uh, so you know, usually when people talk about national security, they're really worried about terrorism just to make you disagree with me even more if you already do. My view is that terrorism is statistically a really small problem and we are unreasonably obsessed with it and we should just relax. And if we had put the resources we put into terrorism into, say, driverless cars, we would have saved 100,000 lives by now. Uh, so, you know, in, in, so in general, like, I just don't think this, the national security concern is something we should be worried about very much. Although, uh, since I am willing to admit that if there were any serious incident, there'd probably be the end of open borders, uh, there is instrumentally a reason to worry about it just in order to prevent a backlash, mm -hmm. which would be unreasonable in any case. Uh, but, you know, there are plenty of things that you can do, just vetting people who have prior history of terrorism. Of course, if you've got them in your hands, then that's a reason to grab them right then. Uh, and other, other point, if you are concerned about national security, having a high population is really good for national security in general. Uh, worth pointing out. I mean, I think in, to make it to sort of further on your point, like if a nation were really worried about it, then that's an argument for creating a guest worker programs and taxing people, taxing mm -hmm. your guest workers a lot so you can mm -hmm. fund your national security, right? Mm -hmm. So I tend to think that uh, sometimes advocates of open borders treat guest worker programs as sort of like the best stopgap measure you might be able to pull off. And one thing you could get out of that is if that's what you were worried about, if you're really concerned about it, raise a lot of taxes off your guest workers, use it to fund your military. Mm -hmm. Including low-skilled guest workers? Yeah, sure. That's all right. Low-skilled guest workers. You heard it here. All right. that's, that's actually my next question is what you both think about a guest worker program, which is maybe a middle ground where you can capitalize on a movement of, of labor without having full-blown immigration. 
in my view, guest worker, guest worker programs are 90% as good as open borders. So it's sti you know, still unfair that you're, that you're treating people differently based upon the way, based upon what side of the, of the invisible line they're, bo they're, they're born on. But again, almost all of the harm that I'm talking about could be overcome. And again, most of the concerns that Garrett has also would be dealt with in the same way. So the main concern is always just the guest workers won't really be guests, and eventually, they will, uh, eventually they, will, uh, they will supposedly come as guests, but they will actually wind up hanging around and having kids and then messing up your institutions in the way that Garrett talks about. Uh, so I guess that would be his concern. But you know, if, you know, um, yeah, my general view is you should never let the best be the enemy of the good. So if there is some halfway measure that will deal with people's concerns while allowing people who are currently not, not able to legally work in the first world to do so, I'm always willing to support that and think that we should. Yeah, this, um, this is a question where political credibility is a key question, right? The economics of a guest worker program is totally obvious. It's a big win for the people who get to come and work. The country can even tax them if they want to and make some money on their side. Um, but uh, the question is, what's politically credible? And I tend to focus on that a lot. It's maybe because I worked in politics, maybe for whatever other reasons. But I think a lot of, a lot of economists are happy to create pie-in-the-sky programs. And when you press the button on them, um, we know politically that those promises don't stick. There are only a few countries in the world that can really say they're going to keep a guest worker program and really mean it. And again, I'll point to Singapore. And the Gulf monarchies. And the Gulf monarchies, yes. Another good example. Or bad example. A lot better than what we do. Yeah. Okay, next question. Uh, given, given the refugee crisis in Europe, and maybe we should branch a question off there and ask if, if that is a crisis or do you foresee a crisis, would you support increasing the amount of immigrants the U.S. takes in if these immigrants come from countries with good SAT scores? You get the last part of that question? Uh, if those immigrants come from countries with good SAT scores. Um, I guess I need the whole question. The so. Um, so does it raise our prosperity? Was that the? Would you support? Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I like the idea of making your country better, right? I mean, that seems like it's a good thing to do. You should look at ways to make um, your country better. In way, and part of the reason I care about that is because I think it's just a personal taste, right? People have moral preferences. Um, but part of that is that the rich countries in the world are creating technology that the rest of the world uses. You know, there are only a few countries in the world where people are coming up with drug innovations, high-tech innovations, computer innovations, automobile innov innovations. And really, the strongest version of the goose that kills the golden egg story is that you weaken your institutions enough that the innovation just goes somewhere else. And maybe the innovation just goes nowhere. So um, again, uh, one reason to worry about uh, making your country better is because you just kind of like your country. Another reason to worry about making your country better is because you think your country is producing golden eggs that are shared the world over. And my view is we should let in refugees from high SAT countries, mid SAT countries, low SAT countries. People there, they are currently in, desperate, in a desperate circumstance. Charity alone would say let them in, but more importantly, it's a temporary problem. They weren't always desperate. If they could have just left before things got to the dire state, they could be paying their own way. So I, I, have a, I have a post on evacuation and how it works. So in the United States, if we see disasters coming, you tell people, evacuate, leave, get out, and this way you minimize the harm. The way that things work, in, work internationally, though, is if a, a horrible thing is going to happen to a country, people are locked in until things get totally desperate, and then you let some people out. It would be better if people could cross borders when they are just worried so they could get out, and then the tragedy could have been avoided in the first place. And of course, the burden on taxpayers would be less because people would be coming under their own steam with their own money and be able to take care of themselves instead of arriving as temporarily desperate and penniless refugees. Uh, question for Professor Kaplan. If GDP effect was uniformly negative with open borders, this is hypothetical, mm -hmm. would you still support open borders? So again, the person that you say, like, yeah, GD, uh, oh, yeah, for the effect for global GDP, or like, like I, I assume. Yeah, so assuming that means effect for global GDP, would I still support it? Depends on how negative it was. So if it was you know, negative 90%, then no. Negative 50%, no. Negative 20%, negative 30%, that's fine. So if the average income of the world would fall by 30%, but the billions of people who are currently desperately poor could compete in labor markets like anybody else, that seems like a very reasonable choice. Uh, and again, system of basic decency. I tend to think that a world like that would be a world where you just got a lot less innovation. So you would be reducing technological innovation, and you'd be short-selling the future of your children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. 
I see innovation as a very rare phenomenon. People haven't been that in innovative in human history. We've gotten it right for about 200 years out of the 10,000 years since we've had agriculture. This might not last forever. Professor Jones, uh, question, correlation is not causation. Uh, this True. deep history shows the correlation, but what is the cause of these differences? In other words, what is the mechanism by which deep history influences? I tend to think that part of it is this institutional channel, but we don't know that much about where institutions come from. Like, why do some governments have better run polities than others? So let me point to one evidence, one piece of evidence on um, culture. So um, this is slightly disagrees with some stuff that Brian was saying earlier. Um, academics have looked, we have some surveys that look at how, whether people keep the, the, um, the attitudes, the social attitudes of their parents and their grandparents when they move from one country to another. And the evidence so far is that on, on questions like trust, degree of entrepreneurship, and some kinds of savings measures, um, those traits persist for at least one or two generations after people switch countries, which is a pretty big change to make. Perhaps more importantly, you can do an okay job, by, not by any means a perfect job, but you can do an okay job guessing some people's social attitudes on a variety of topics, not by just looking at the migrants' parents and grandparents, but by looking at the average attitude back in their home country. So contrary to what Brian says, which is that after a century, after a generation or two, people just forget about their old country, they forget about the czar. Um, the actual empirical evidence, the vast empirical literature, suggests that people, even after a few generations, keep some attitudes that are a little bit like the attitudes back in the home country. So to put it bluntly, Italian Americans, even after many generations, even people who don't think of themselves as that Italian, they, they are probably just a little bit, perhaps more than a little bit, like the average Italian in a bunch of social ways. Not clear why that's true, I just know that it's been quite well documented. So if cultural traits are persistent over time, and if migrants are actually changing institutions when they go there, partly through the voting process, partly because they're likely to work in the government, those, that, the, the culture, the voting, and the working in government channels, I think, are three good channels to, to look at. And again, all have some story that you can uh, point to with empirical literature. Okay, Professor Kaplan, you say that a country's government that's good will stay good, and a country's government that is bad will likely stay bad, using Haiti as your example. How does a country like Zimbabwe fit into your theory since it went from very good to very bad so very fast? Yes, so I would disagree that Zimbabwe was ever good. It was good for a small minority of white people and quite bad for the, for the rest of the population. So you know, is it better now than it was? No, it's worse. And it should go from being bad, bad to even worse. As, as, to, uh, as to the de details of what happened, I'm not an expert in, Zimb in Zimb in, uh, Zimbabwean history. Although, in general, if, if a minority goes and treats the majority of the country really badly, and then power has handed over and by, uh, after violence to the, minor to the majority, uh, you should expect things are going to be really bad afterwards. That's the general rule. Uh, as to what would have happened if, uh, the, if the white minority had treated the black majority much better, I think things would have turned out a lot better, but we'll never know. I'm going to break the rule and actually allow us a question from the floor. It's your question, Dale. I can't read your. <laughs> so I'm going to let you be the one. Yes. Mm-hmm. The great thing about open borders is that, especially in the short run, it actually works, right? <laughs> so the evidence for aid working is so mixed that there's really, it's, there's actually debate on whether you're, whether you're helping countries or hurting them. I tend to think there's some evidence you're helping them a bit, but the thing about open borders, if you're focused on the short run, it definitely works. And remittances that people send from rich countries back to poor countries are just life-changing. I mean, I've been to a couple of, of, of lower, middle or lower income countries that have a lot of remittances, where a lot of remittances are sent back from the rich countries, and you can just see it. You can just see it walking around the shopping malls, right? 
people's lives are changed, and you can see it in, in, in ways large and small, both at malls and just how people live in villages. Um, so remittances are a great thing, and they're life-changing, and they're better than just about any other development policy you have. The question is, what's the long-run effect of having different folks in your country? And if you have a choice between letting in folks that raise your SAT score and rate the ones that lower, you have to decide for yourself what's the morally best choice to go with. So, I mean, I agree with basically everything Garrett said. And I would just add, since Garrett is trying to make you, fe make you fear the end of economic growth as a result of immigration coming and ruining our institutions, worth pointing out that there are right now a large number of geniuses whose lives are wasted in, in, in desperately poor villages. Absolutely who right. Die, who die unknown. Absolutely and right. I know, so I know, you know Garrett would, I, I, at least I believe Garrett would be very much in favor of handpicking the ones who do well in tests and letting them come to the first world. The problem is many of them are probably so desperately poor that they aren't even able to yep. do the test. And right now we lose out on those people. And in a, world, in a world of open borders, all the world's geniuses, including the, great, the unsung ones, the ones that we never see, would be able to come to the centers of technology, science, culture and contribute and again uh, lay, lay extra golden eggs that currently are not laid because they are stuck in places where their talents just go to waste. Yeah, And that actually leads to a follow-up question uh, along those lines which is, uh, Professor Jones, is there a way to select people with high SAT scores in a reliable way? Would we select them by individual or would we select them by country or would there be some other method? Well, let me just stick with the methods. Rather than being hypothetical, let me just stick with methods that actually exist and work right now. Right? So Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Hong Kong, Singapore, these are all countries that focus explicitly on high-skilled immigration. Um, some people might call their systems desperately immoral, um, but they're letting people change their lives by going from poor countries to richer ones. They look to see, in some cases, whether you have an engineering degree, whether you have some, tr some skill in a trade that the people really need, um, are you really educated? Do you have an advanced degree from a fancy school? Whatever it is. These are all metrics that people use right now. There are better metrics you could use, but let's just talk about the ones we have. Those are discriminatory. They discriminate against people on the basis of having this degree or that skill, and yet few people find that to be something to globally complain about. So that form of um, immigration policy seems to be making those, Im Im making those nations better places to live in. We now move to uh, closing statements. Uh, Professor uh, Jones will begin. Professor Kaplan will close. And don't forget that Professor Jones has books to sell. Yes, I do. Just a few left. Bring him your money. And yeah. uh, with that, we'll move to closing statements. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. So um, thanks. So uh, my, my, I, some of my ideas have been discussed on the Open Borders blog. This is openborders.info. It's a place I'd recommend to you. You should spend some time on there. Um, Brian was instrumental in helping to found it. Um, some of his, uh, quite, a few, quite a few very smart people around the world have been strong activists in the Open Borders movement, and they've been exceptionally candid about talking the strengths and weaknesses of their own position. In most of politics, in most of student activism, you see a lot of people just emphasizing the strengths of their story, um, downplaying the weaknesses, calling their enemies evil. People at openborders.info are candid. I really appreciate that. So here's a quote from the Open Borders blog. This is from an a, a economics professor named Nathan Smith, who uh, studied at GMU a few years ago. Um, he says, the claim that open borders would dramatically raise world GDP cannot withstand the hive mind hypothesis about the determination of GDP. You'll notice that the hive mind hypothesis has something to do with this book here. So according to the leading blog, the leading online presence for the open borders movement, my theory has something to do with open borders, um, has something to do with the success of open borders. So the open borders, the hive mind hypothesis, as I put it, is the theory that your fellow citizens shape your productivity, your income, your worldview by shaping your government, your culture, and much more. So I want you to see the national economy as a team effort. So on some level, what I'm saying is that President Obama was right when he said, you didn't build that. Everything we do in this country is a product of numerous institutions that none of us ourselves created. And we should be grateful for them and treat them as rare treasures. So, um, 
a, uh, this, uh, this, this post on the Open Borders website got quite a bit of attention uh, a few months ago, and uh, from the mainstream media, in fact. Um, not, just from, not just from sort of college student activist types or academics, but got a fair amount of mainstream media attention. So here's from the Open Borders blog earlier this year. What, how would a billion immigrants change the American polity? And you can see here, um, governing, uh, this is again Nathan Smith writing about this, governing a much larger population would necessitate improvisational and sometimes authoritarian expedients. And certainly American certain American ideals would die of their own increasing impracticality. You know, little things like equality of employment, the social safety net, one person, one vote, non-discrimination in employment. I personally, as if you look on my, my past uh, speeches and talks that I've given, um, I'm per no particular fan of, uh, one, of unlimited democracy. I think uh, democracy is at least slightly overrated. But here's what Nathan's thinking might be uh, some of the cost of switching to open borders. So here's more continued from that post. If open borders included open voting, U.S. political institutions would be overhauled very quickly as parties reinvented themselves to appeal to the vast immigrant masses. And many natives, that's the term he uses, would retreat into gated communities, not so much from fear of crime as simply from love of the familiar. So a world of gated communities, a world where you don't talk to your neighbors, a world where your political systems are changing incredibly rapidly, this might be the world of open borders. Um, so here's his optimistic conclusion. Um, in short, I think that the most wild-eyed predictions of the open borders optimists will come true and to spare. But I think a lot of the forebodings of the grimmest open borders pessimists will prove more than justified. Let me add my small editorial commentary on this. The first half of that sentence, true in the short run. In the short run, the most wild-eyed predictions of open borders activists, totally true. Life-changing prosperity for the migrants. The opportunity to send remittances back to their home country and, and keep their children alive, keep their children healthier. This is an incredibly wonderful benefit. We'd be, you should want to be very reluctant to give that up. But in the long run, I think a lot of the forebodings of the grimmest open borders pessimist will also prove more than justified. Thanks. Well, uh, Nathan Smith, the guy that Gary was quoting, is a really smart guy. I don't actually agree with many of the things that he said. Uh, in particular, there's a question of a billion migrants over what time horizon? So, a billion, a billion migrants who showed up today through teleportation. That is a reason that it, uh, these concerns are reasonable. A billion migrants spread out over the course of a century? I don't think that's, near, you know, that, that's nearly so reasonable at all because, again, each time you have a wave that is being acculturated, the first generation is just basically trying to figure out a way to get by in a new society. Their kids are acculturated, again, possibly not completely, but uh, so as to, so the papers that Garrett is talking about, uh, I've read a lot about this, so I'm not familiar with them, so every now and then Garrett hides papers from me, and I feel like, I feel like his responsibility every time he comes across something to immediately send me the link, but uh, so that I can deal with it. Yes, ah, mostly on Twitter. All right. Uh, so, a few comments. So, one, so there, there, there's, there, there is a strange claim that Garrett has made. So he's talked about how, con how we should be focused on, uh, focusing on things 100 or more years in the future. Uh, that sounds really good, although it also implies a whole bunch of other things that almost nobody believes. For example, it would be really great to have re extremely high taxes and then invest them in very low interest rate bonds so that we can then bequeath a very large inheritance to our descendants. This is another great way of making our descendants richer. Furthermore, you don't even have to wait for the government to do it. You can do it. If you're really concerned about your children and grandchildren not being rich enough, cut back on your consumption dramatically, invest it, and then hand it to them when you die. And you can do this without, having any, without, without restricting immigration, totally open to you right now. If you don't want to do this for your own children and grandchildren when it's in your own power, why exactly is it that you favor a coercive policy which deprives basic rights to, to accept a job from a willing employer to desperately poor people all over the planet? I have no idea. I mean, if you really believed in this time horizon that Gary's talking about, most of us actually would be working right now in order to increase our kids' inheritance. I'm not doing it. You know, why not? Because I think my kids are going to be doing fine. Your kids will be doing fine. The future will take care of itself because there is general economic growth. It's been going on a long time. Garrett can be nervous that it's suddenly going to die off. I will bet against that. This seems, again, paranoid to me, which is a problem that I just see with much of what Garrett is saying. Garrett is very worried. He does paint scary scenarios. 
but as to why we should actually be even half as worried or 10% as worried as he claims to be. And again, actually, honestly, I'm especially puzzled because Garrett strikes me as a very upbeat person. So when very grim people are focused on worst case scenarios, I think, oh, that's just them. But Garrett, in a way, I'm just confused because he doesn't actually seem worried about, uh, personally, about the things that he is so concerned about, about, says that we should all be concerned about. He does say that he doesn't, that he doesn't have kids, so he's not that worried personally about the future. He does have nephews and nieces, he seems to love them, but I suspect that he, but he still went and spent $450 on a dinner in Chicago rather than putting it in an investment account to increase their inheritance. Yes, which again is no aspersion on Garrett. I would, <laughs> yes, <laughs> no aspersion on Garrett, just indicate that like almost everyone else, he doesn't actually care very much about what's going to happen in 100 years either, and probably for the reasonable, re reasonable, reasonable basis that people in 100 years are going to be vastly richer than us, so if anything, we should be trying to live at their expense rather than the other way around. Uh, now, there is you know, one, one odd thing about Garrett. Uh, there is what I call a moral evasiveness. So when you ask him, well, what should we actually do? He just tries to say, I'm not talking about that. And yet, yeah. there is an undertone about what we should do, which I think is fairly clear. Mm -hmm. And I mean, a lot of it is that Garrett's views of applied, consistency, applied consistently would apply, imply a lot of other views that almost everyone would consider horrific. So for example, we could also go and improve our SAT scores by a one-child policy or a no-child policy for everyone who's already in this country who's descended from low SAT stock. Does Garrett favor that? He's, uh, so, well, it's complicated. I said, no, I, 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 but, so I'm not saying that he does. But if he actually, actually had the views that he, had, that, that, that he says he has, I ask the question, why not? Why wouldn't you favor these things? He said, well, that's just wrong to treat the people like that. It's wrong to say that you can't have too many kids because your parents, or your, your parents or other ancestors didn't practice agriculture for a sufficient number of millennia. Why is it not wrong to do that to people who have been born in other countries? At least why isn't it presumptively wrong? Why isn't it the kind of thing, why isn't it the kind of thing where there need, need to be very strong proof of a very large bad effect rather than what's erring on the side of caution. Well, we don't know if your kids will mess things up, so you can't have any. Uh, that does seem strange to me. Uh, now, on the research that Garrett is mentioning, uh, so again, I encourage actually all of you to read it. I'm going to be blogging in coming weeks, in current weeks, because while it says what Garrett says for the most part, it also says a bunch of other things that are inconsistent with what Garrett says. Papers that he actually cites have two main kinds of effects. One of them is there's an effect of your, of your ends of migration adjusted, of migration adjusted population but there are also direct effects of geography, and these effects of geography can totally be overcome just by moving people out of geographically, mm -hmm. uh, ge geographically disfavored zones. Yep. Uh, if Garrett had, had one in had Bruce and tables showing that the net effect, even factoring in the benefits of geographic change, were still negative, he'd have a stronger case, but he didn't do that. Uh, I am actually planning on doing that in some coming weeks, so we'll see what I learn. So either way, I will report it, try a scout's honor, uh, however it turns out. Uh, hmm. Uh, by the way, so on the question of, you know, so should we, you know, should we admit people based upon, uh, based upon their personal SAT scores? Actually, by definition, there is no such thing as a personal SAT score. If, you are, if your ancestors come from an area, I guess like, like if you had a mix of ancestors, then you would have a personal SAT score that was different from the, from the typical person in your country. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but, you know, but if you are of pure Chinese stock, then you automatically have the pure Chinese, uh, the pure Chinese SAT score. So what, so, uh, what Garrett's talking about is a, is a very different approach. Which, which again, if it's a matter of let's let in everybody at least who meets these standards, then I'm all for that. So we, if all that Garrett were to say is let's at minimum let in all the people that we can be very confident will make things better, I'd say that would be a big improvement because right now we don't even let them in. In fact, the vast majority of people that Garrett's own principles say should be allowed in are currently barred for reasons that are mysterious to both of us, I think. Thank you. comments after the last debate that the debaters did not engage each other enough, and I encouraged uh, Professor Scaffold and Jones to do that. And I think they've done that. I think we owe them our gratitude tonight. And again, I thank you for coming. You're welcome to stick around and uh, visit with them and one another, and look forward to seeing you next semester. Thanks very much.